Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily, Ostara, and Chloe. So I always want to remind you to please stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. And without further ado, we're going to get to the next several chapters of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, starting at, off at chapter 16. And without further ado, let's get there. Alright, today we are on chapter 16, starting at chapter 16 of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. And here we are. Let's see here. And open up to the book. Okay, here we go. Something woke him much later. A crash loud enough to cause him to sit up in bed, wondering if Ellie had fallen onto the floor or if maybe Gage's crib had collapsed. Then the moon sailed out from behind a cloud, flooding the room with cold white light, and he saw Victor Pascal standing in the doorway. The crash had been Pascal throwing open the door. He stood there with his head bashed in behind the left temple. The blood had drained, dried on his face and maroon stripes like Indian war paint. His collarbone jutted whitely. He was grinning. Come on, Dr. Pascal said. We got places to go. Lewis looked around. His wife was a vague hump under her yellow comforter, sleeping deeply. He looked at, back at Pasco, who was dead, but somehow not dead. Yet Lewis felt no fear. He realized why almost at once. It's a dream, he thought, and it was only in his relief that he realized he had been fright, frightened after all. The dead do not return. It is physiologically impossible. This young man is in an empty drawer in Bangor with the pathologist's tattoo of Y cut stitched back up on him. The pathologist probably tossed his brain into his chest cavity after taking a tissue sample and filled up the <clears throat> filled up the skull cavity with a brown paper to prevent leaking, simple simpler than trying to fit the brain back into the skull like a jigsaw piece into a puzzle. Uncle Carl, father of the the unfortunate Ruthie, had told him that pathologists did that and all sorts of other random information that he supposed would give Rachel with her death phobia the screaming horrors. But Pascal was not here. No way, baby. Pascal was in a refrigerated locker with a tag around his toe, and he is most certainly not wearing those red jogging shorts in, him, in there. Yet the compulsion to get up was strong. Pascal's eyes were upon him. He threw back the covers and swung his feet onto the floor. The hooked rug, a wedding present from Rachel's grandmother long ago, pressed cold novels into the balls of his feet. The dream had a remarkable reality. It was so real that he would not follow Pascal until Pascal had turned and begun to go back down the stairs. The compulsion to follow was strong, but he did not want to be touched, even in a dream by a weak walking corpse, but he did follow. Pascal's jogging shorts glimmered. They crossed the living room, dining room, kitchen. Lewis expected Pascal to turn the lock and then lift the latch on the door, which connected the kitchen to the shed where he garaged the station wagon in the Civic or Pascal did no such thing. Instead of opening the door, he simply passed through it, and Lewis, watching, thought with mild amazement, was that how it's done? Remarkable. Anyone could do that. <laughs> he tried it himself and was a little amused to meet only unyielding wood. Apparently, he was a hard-headed realist, even in his dreams. Lewis twisted the knob on the yield lock, lifted the latch, and let himself into the shed garage. Pascal was not there. Lewis wondered briefly if Pascal just ceased to exist. Figures in dreams often did just that. So did locations after you, I mean, excuse me, locations first. You were standing nude by a swimming pool with a raging hard on, discussing the possibilities of wife swapping with, say, Roger and Missy Dandridge. Then you blinked, and you were climbing the side of a Hawaiian volcano. Maybe he had lost Pascal because that, this was the beginning of Act Two. But when Lewis emerged from the garage, he saw her again, standing in the faint moonlight at the back of the lawn, at the head of the path. Now fear came, came entering softly, sifting through the hollow places of his body and filling them up with the dirty smoke. He didn't want to go up there. He halted. Pascal glanced back over his shoulder, and in the moonlight his eyes were silver. Lewis felt a hopeless crawl of horror in his belly. 
that jutting bone, those dried clots of blood, but it was hopeless to resist those eyes. This was apparently a dream about being hypnotized, being dominated, being, bon being unable to change things, perhaps the way he had been unable to change the fact of Pascal's death. You could go to school for 20 years and you still couldn't do a thing when they brought a guy in who had been rammed into a tree hard enough to open a window in his skull. They might as well have called a plumber, a rainmaker, or the man from Glad. And even as these thoughts passed through his mind, he was drawn forward onto the path. He followed the jogging shorts as maroon in this light, as the dried blood on Pascal's face. He didn't like this dream. Oh, God, not at all. It was too real. The cold nubbles in the, in the rug, the way he had not been able to pass through the shed door when a person could, could or should be able to walk through doors and walls in any self-respecting dream. And now the cool brush of dew on his bare feet, and the feel of the night wind, just a breath of it on his body, which was naked except for his jockey shorts, once under the trees, pine needles stuck on the soles of his feet, Another little detail that was just a bit more re real than it needed to be. Never mind, never mind, I am home in my own bed. It's just a dream no matter how vivid, and like all other dreams, it will seem ridiculous in the morning. My waking mind will discover its inconsistencies. The small branch of a dead tree poked his bicep rudely, and he winced. Up ahead, Pascal was only a moving shadow, and now Lewis's terror seemed to have crystallized into a bright sculpture in his mind. I am following a dead man into the woods. I am following a dead man up to pet the pet cemetery, and this is no dream. God help me, this is no dream. This is happening. They walked down the far side of the wooded hill. The path curved in lazy shapes between the trees and then plunged into the jelly into the underbrush. No boots now. The ground is all in the cold jelly under his feet. Grabbing and holding, letting go only reluctantly, there were ugly sucking noises. He could feel the mud oozing between his toes, trying to separate them. He tried desperately to hold on to the dream idea. It wouldn't wash. They reached the clearing, and the moon sailed free of its reef of clouds again, bathing the gra graveyard with ghastly effulgence. The leaning markers, bits of board, and tin cans that had been cut with a father's tin snips had then hammered into rude squares, chipped chunks of shale and slate stood out with three-dimensional clarity, casting shadows perfectly black and defined. Pascal stopped near Smucky the Cat. He was obedient and turned back toward Lewis. The horror, the terror, he felt these things would grow in him until his body blew apart, until their soft yet implacable pressure. Pascal was grinning. <coughs> his bloody lips were wrinkled back from his teeth, and his healthy road crew tan in the moon's bony light had become overlaid with the white of a corpse about to be sewn into its winding shroud. He lifted his one arm and pointed. Lewis looked in that direction and moaned. His eyes grew wide, and he crammed his knuckles upon against his mouth. There was coolness on his cheeks. And he realized that in the extremity of his terror, he had begun to weep. The dreadful, the dread fall from which Judd Crandall had called <coughs> excuse me, Ellie in alarm had become a heap of bones. The bones were moving. They writhed and clicked together. Mandibles and femurs and ulnas and molars and sizes. He saw the grinning skulls of humans and animals. Finger bones glittered. Here the remains of a foot flexed its pallid joints. Ah, it was moving, it was creeping. Pascal was walking toward him now, his bloody face grim in the moonlight. And the last of Lewis's coherent mind began to slip away in a yammering, cyclic thought. You gotta scream yourself awake. Doesn't matter if you scare Rachel Ellie Gage. <clears throat> Wake the whole household, the whole neighborhood. Got to scream yourself awake, scream, 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 yourself awake, wake, wake, but only a thin whisper of air would come. It was the sound of a little kid sitting on a stoop somewhere and trying to teach himself to whistle. Pascal came closer and then spoke. The door must not be open, Pascal said. He was looking down at Lewis, because Lewis had fallen to his knees. There was a look on his face, which Lewis at first mistook for compassion. 
It wasn't really compassion at all, only a dreadful kind of patience. Still, he pointed at the moving pile of bones. Don't go beyond, no matter how much you feel you need to, Doctor. The barrier was not made to be broken. Remember this. There's more power here than you know. It is old and always restless. Remember. Lewis tried again to scream. He could not. I come as a friend, P Pasco said. But was friend actually the word Pasco would use? L Lewis thought not. It was as if Pasco had spoken in a foreign language which Lewis could understand through some dream magic. And friend was as close to whatever word Pasco would actually use that Lewis's struggle in mind could come. Your destruction, the dest instruction of all you love is very near, Doctor. It was close enough for Lewis to be able to smell death on him. Pasco reached, reaching for him, the soft matting and click of the bones. I noticed it. Lewis began to overbalance in his effort to get away from the hand. His own hand struck a monument and tilted it into the earth. Pasco's face leaning down filled the sky. Doctor, remember, Lewis tried to scream and the world whirled away, but still he heard the click of moving bones in the moonlit lit crypt of the night. And we're on to chapter 17. And let's set it up. Where am I going here? Okay. 17. It takes the average human seven minutes to go to sleep, but according to Han's human physiology, it takes the average human 15 to... 27 to wake up. It is as if sleep is a pool from which emerging is more difficult than entering. When the sleeper wakes, he or she comes up by degrees. From deep sleep to light sleep to what it's, is sometimes called waking sleep, a state in which the sleeper can hear sounds and will even respond to questions without being aware of it later, even except perhaps as fragments of dream. Lewis heard the click and rattle of bones, but gradually this sound became Sharper, more metallic. There was a bang, a yell, more metallic sound. Something rolling, sure, his drifting mind agreed. Roll them bones. He heard his daughter calling, Get it, Gage, go get it. This was followed by Gage's crow of delight. The sound to which Lewis opened his eyes and saw the ceiling of his own bedroom. He held himself perfectly still, waiting for the reality, the good reality, the blessed reality to come home all the way. All a dream, no matter how terrible, how real it had all been a dream, only a fossil in the mind and un under his mind. The metallic sound came again. It was one of Gage's toy cars being rolled along the upstairs hall. Get it, Gage. Get it, Gage. Yelled, get it, get it, get it. Thumpa, thumpa, thumpa. Gage's small, bare feet thundering along the hallway runner. He and Ellie were giggling. Lewis looked to his right. Rachel's bed was empty. The covers thrown back. The sun was well up. He glanced at his watch and saw it was nearly eight o'clock. Rachel let him oversleep, probably on purpose. Ordinarily, this would have irritated him, but this morning it did not. He drew in a deep breath and let it out, content for the moment to lie here with a bar of sunlight slanting in through the window, feeling the unmistakable texture of the real world. Dust motes danced in the sunlight. Rachel called upstairs. Better come down and get your snack and get up. Go out for the bus, L. Okay, the louder clack, clack of her feet. Here's your car, Gage. I've got to go to school. Gage began to yell indignantly, although it was garbled. The only clear words being, Gage, car, get in, Ellie, bus. His text seemed clear enough. Ellie should stay. Public education could go hang for the day. <laughs> Rachel's voice again. Give your dad a shake before you come down, L. Ellie came in, her hair done up in a ponytail, wearing a red... Dress. I'm a wig, baby. Said, go on and get your bus. Okay, Daddy. She came over, kissed a slightly scruffy cheek, and bolted for the stairs. The dream was beginning to fade, to lose its coherence. A damn good thing, too. Gage yelled, come give your dad a kiss. Gage ignored this. He was following Ellie downstairs as rapidly as he could, yelling, get it, get it, get it, get it, at the top of his lungs. Lewis caught just a glimpse of a sturdy little kid's body, clad only in diapers and rubber pants. Rachel called up again. Lewis, was that you? You awake? Yeah, he said, sitting up. Told you he was, Ellie called. I'm going. by The slam of the front door. Engage's outraged belly bellow punctuated this. One egg or two, Rachel called. Lewis pushed back the blankets and swung his feet out onto the nubs of the hooked 
rug, ready to tell her he'd skip the eggs, just a bowl of cereal, and he'd run. And the words died in his throat. His feet were filthy with dirt and pine needles. His heart leapt up in his throat like a crazy jack-in-the-box, moving fast, eyes bulging, uh, teeth clamped unfeelingly on his tongue. He kicked the covers all the way back. The foot of his bed was littered with needles. The sheets were mucky and dirty. Lewis, he saw a few errant pine needles on his knees. And suddenly he looked at his right, at his right arm. There was a scratch there on the bicep. Fresh scratch. Exactly where the dead branch had poked him in the dream. I'm going to scream. I can feel it. And he could, too. It was roaring up from inside. Nothing but a big cold bullet of fear. Reality shimmered. Reality. The real reality, he thought. It was those needles. The filth on the sheets. The bloody scratch on his bare arm. I'm going to scream, and then I'll go crazy, and I won't have to worry about it anymore. That's my good girl there. Lewis Rachel was coming up the Dares. Lewis, did you go back to sleep? He grappled for himself in those two or three seconds. He fought grimly for himself, just as he had done in those moments of roaring confusion after Pascal had been brought into the medical center, dying in a blanket. He won. The thought which tipped the scales was that she must not see him this way, his feet muddy and coated with needles. The blanket tossed back onto the floor to reveal the muck-splashed ground sheet. I'm awake, he called cheerfully. His tongue was bleeding from the sudden, involuntary bite he had given it. His mind swirled, and somewhere deep inside, away from the action, he wondered if it, he had always been without touching, within touching distance of some mad irrationalities if everyone was. One egg or two she had stopped in the second or third rise. Thank God. Two, he said, barely aware of what he was saying, scrambled. Good for you, she said, and went back downstairs again. He closed his eyes briefly and relief, but in the darkness he saw Pascal's silver eyes. His eyes flew upon open again. Lewis began to move rapidly, putting off any further thought. He jerked the bed clothes off his bed. The blankets were okay. He separated out the two sheets, balled them up, took them into the hallway, and dumped them down the laundry chute. Almost running, he entered the bathroom, jerked the shower handle on, and stepped under water to so hot it was nearly scalding, unmindful. He washed the dirt from his feet and legs. He began to feel better, more in control. Drying off, it struck him that this was how murderers must feel when they believe they have gotten rid of all the evidence. He began to laugh. He went on drying himself, but he also went on laughing. He couldn't seem to stop. Hey, up there, Rachel called. What's so funny? Private joke, Lewis called back, still laughing. He was frightened, but the fright didn't stop the laughter. The laughter came rising from a belly that was as hard as stones mortared into a wall. It occurred to him that shoving his sheets down the laundry chute was absolutely the best thing he could have done. Missy Dandridge came in five days to vacuum clean and do the laundry. Rachel would never see the, those sheets at all until she put them back on his bed clean. He supposed it was possible that Missy would mention to Rachel, but he didn't think so. She would probably whisper to her husband that the creeds were playing some strange sex game that involved mud and pine needles instead of body paints. This thought made Lewis laugh all the harder. The last of the giggles and chuckles dried up as he was dressing, and he realized that he felt a little better. How that could be, he didn't know, but he did. The room looked normal now except for his stripped bed. He, get, he had gotten rid of the poison. Maybe evidence was actually what he was looking for, but in his mind it felt like poison. Perhaps this is what people do with the inexplicable, he thought. This is what they do with the irrational that refuses to be broken down into the normal causes and effects that run the Western world. Maybe this was how your mind coped with a flying saucer you saw hovering silently over your back field one morning, casting its own tight little pool of shadow, the rain of frogs, the hand from under the bed that stroked your bare foot in the dead of night. It was a giggling fit or a crying fit, and since it was its own and viable, viable, viable self and would not break down, you simply passed terror intact like a kidney stone. Gage was in his chair, eating cocoa bears, decorating the table with it. He was decorating the plastic mac under his high chair with cocoa bears, apparently shampooing with it. All right, what did I just find that? Rachel came out of the kitchen with his eggs and a cup of coffee. What was the big joke, Lou? You were laughing like a loon up there. Scared me a little. Lewis opened his mouth with no idea of what he was going to say, 
what came out was a joke he had heard the week before as the corner market down the road something wrote a Jewish tailor who bought a parrot whose only line was Ariel Sharon jerks off. By the time he finished, Rachel was laughing too, so was Gage for that matter. Fine, our hero was taking care of all the evidence to wet the muddy sheets and the loony laughter in the bathroom. Our hero will now read the morning paper, or at least look at it, putting the seal of normality on the morning. So thinking, Lewis opened the paper. That's what you do all right, he thought with immeasurable relief. You pass it like a stone. And that's the end of it, unless there comes a campfire night some some night with friends when the wind is high and the talk turns to inexplicable events. Because on campfire nights, when the wind is high, talk is cheap. He ate his eggs. He kissed Rachel and Gage. He glanced at the square white panel painted laundry cabinet at the foot of the chute only as he left. Everything was okay. It was another knockout of the morning. Late summer showed every sign of just going on forever, and everything was okay. He glanced at the path as he backed the car to the garage, but that was okay, too. Never turned a hair. You passed it like a stone. Everything was okay until he had gotten ten miles down the road, and then the shakes hit him so hard that he had to pull up Route 2 and into the morning deserted parking lot of Sing's, a Chinese restaurant not far from the Eastern Main Medical Center, where Pascal's body would have been taken. EMMC, that is not Sing's. <laughs> Vic Pascal was never going to eat another helping of Mugu Gai Pan, ha ha. The shakes twisted his body, ripped at it, had their way with it. Lewis felt helpless and terrified. Not terrified of anything supernatural, not in his, this bright sunshine, but simply terrified of the possibility that he might be losing his mind. It felt as if a long, visible wire was being twirled through his head. No more, he said. Please, no more. He fumbled for the road and got Joan Baez singing about diamonds and rust. Her sweet, cool voice soothed him, and by the time she had finished, Lewis felt that he could drive on. When he got to the medical center, he called hello to Char Charlton and then ducked into the bathroom, believing that he must look like hell. Not so. He was a little hollow under the eyes, but not even Rachel had noticed that. He slapped some cold water on his face, dried off, combed his hair, and went into his office. Steve Masterton, Indian doctor, Surendra Hardu, we're in there drinking coffee and continuing to go over the front file. Morning, Lou, Steve said. Morning. Let's hope it's not like last morning, Hardu said. That's right. You missed all the excitement. Surrender. Plenty of excitement himself last night, Masterton said. Grinning, tell him, Surrender. Hardu pushed his, polished his glasses, smiling. Two boys bring in their lady friend around one o'clock in the morning, he said. She's very happily drunk. Celebrating the return to university, you understand. She's cut one quite badly, and I tell her it will be at least four stitches, no scar. Stitch away, she tells me, and so I do, bending over like this. How do you de demonstrate his salaming over an invisible thigh? Lewis began to grin, sensing that what was coming, and as I am suturing, the she vomits on my head. Masterton broke up, so did Lewis. How do you smile? Calmly, as if this had happened to him thousands of times in thousands of lives. Surrender, how long have you been on duty? Lewis asked when the laughter died. Since midnight, Hardu said. I'm just leaving, but I wanted to stay, stay long enough to say hello again. Well, hello, said Lewis said, shaking his small brown hand. Now go home and go to sleep. We're almost through with the front file, Masterton said. Say hello, sur say hallelujah, Surrender. I decline, Hardu said, smiling. I am not a Christian. Then sing the course of instant karma or something. <clears throat> May you both shine on, Hardu said, still smiling and glided out the door. Lewis and Steve Mar Masterton looked after him for a moment, silent, and then looked at each other. They broke out laughing to Lewis. No laugh had ever felt so good, so normal. Just as well, we got the file finished up. Steve said, today's the day we put the welcome mat over the dope pushers. Lewis nodded. First of the drug salesmen would begin arriving at 10, as Steve liked to crack. Wednesday night be... Wednesday might be Prince Spaghetti Day, but at UMO every Tuesday was a D Day. It was D Day. The D stood for <clears throat> Darvon, your all time favorite. A word of advice, old great boss, Steve said. I don't know what these guys were like out in Chicago, but around here they'll stoop to just about anything from all expenses paid hunting jungles, uh, hunting junkets into the Allagash in November, to free bowling at family fun lanes in Bangor. 
I had one guy try to give me one of those inflatable Julie, <coughs> Judy dolls. Me, and I'm only a PA. If they can't sell you drugs, they'll drive you to them. Should have taken the Judy doll. Nah, she was a redhead, not my type. Well, I'll agree, I agree with Surrender, Lewis said, just as long as it's not like yesterday. And we're on to Chapter 18. When the rep from Up John didn't turn up promptly at 10, Lewis gave in and called the registrar's office. He spoke with a Mrs. Stapleton who said she would send over a copy of Victor Pascal's records immediately. And when Lewis hung up, the Up John guy was there. He didn't try to give Lewis anything, only asked him if he had any interest in buying a season ticket to the New England Patriots games at a discount. Nope, Lewis said. I didn't think you would, the Up John guy said glumly and left. At noon, Lewis walked up to the bear's den and got a tuna fish sandwich and a Coke. He brought them back to his office and ate lunch while going over to Pascal's records. He was looking for some connection with himself or with North Ludlow where the pet cemetery was. A vague belief, he supposed, that there must be some sort of rational explanation even for such a weird occurrence as this. Maybe the guy had grown up in Ludlow... <clears throat> had maybe even buried a dog or a cat up there. He didn't find the connection he was looking for. Pascal was from Bergenville, New Jersey, and had come to UMO to study electrical engineering. In those few typed sheets, Lewis could see no possible connection between himself and the young man who had died in the reception room, other than the mortal one, of course. He sucked the last Coke out of his cup, listening to the straw crackle in the bottom, and then tossed all his trash into the waste basket. Lunch had been light, but he had eaten it with good appetite. Nothing much wrong with the way he felt, really. Not now. There had been no recurrence of the shakes. Now even that morning's horror began to seem more like a nasty, pointless surprise, dream like itself of no consequence. He drummed his fingers on his blotter, shrugged, and picked up the phone again. He dialed the EMMC and asked for the morgue. After he was connected with the pathology clerk, he identified himself and said, You have one of our students there, Victor Pascal. Not anymore, the, vo the voice at the other end said. He's gone. Lewis's throat closed. At last, he managed what? His body was flown back to his parents late last night. Guy from Brookings Smith Mortuary came and took custody. They put him on Delta, uh, papers riffling. Delta Flight 109. Where did you think he went? Out dancing at the show ring? That's funny. No, Lewis said, of no, of course not. It's just, it was just, what the Christ was he doing pursuing this anyway? There was no sane way to deal with it. It had to be let go, marked off, forgotten. Anything else was asking for a lot of pointless trouble. It's just that it seemed very quick, he finished lamely. Well, he was autopsied, autopsied yesterday afternoon, that faint riffle of papers again, at around 3.20 by Rinsewick. By that, then his father had made all the arrangements. I imagine the body got to Newark by 2 in the morning. Oh, well, in that case. Unless one of the carriers screwed up and sent it somewhere else, a pathology clerk said brightly. We've had that happen, you know. Although never with Delta. Delta's actually pretty good. We had a guy who died in a fishing trip way up in a roosted county. In one of those little towns that just have a couple of map coordinates for a name. Asshole strangled on a pup top while he's chugging a can of beer. Took his buddies two days to buck him out of the wilderness. And you know that by then it's a toss up whether or not the, for the forever group will take. But they shoved it in and hoped for the best. Send him home to Grand Falls, Minnesota in the cargo department of some airliner, but there was a screw-up. They shipped him first to Miami, then to Des Moines, then to Fargo, North Dakota. Finally, somebody wised up, but by then, another three days had gone by. Nothing took. They might as well have injected him with Kool-Aid instead of John to flow. The guy was totally black and smelled like a spoiled pork roast. Whoa. That's what I heard anyway. Six baggage handlers got sick. The voice on the other end of the line laughed heartily. Lewis closed his eyes and said, well, thank you. I can give you Dr. Rinswick's home phone if you want it, doctor, but he usually plays golf up in Orono in the morning. That's okay, Lewis said. He hung up the telephone. Let that put pay, paid to it, he thought. When you were having that crazy dream or whatever it was, Pasco's body was almost certainly in a Bergen Field funeral home. That closes it off. Let that be the end of it. Driving home that afternoon, a simple explanation of the filth at the foot of the bed finally occurred to him, flooding him with a relief. He had experienced an isolated incident of sleepwalking, brought on by the unexpected and extremely upsetting happening 
happenstance of having a student mortally injured and then dying in his infirmary during his first real day on the job. It explained everything. The dream had seemed extremely real because large parts of it were real. The feel of the carpet, the cold dew, and of course the dead branch that had scratched his arm. It explained why Pascal had been able to walk through the door and he, he had not. Picture rose in his mind, a picture of Rachel coming downstairs last night and catching him bumping against the back door, trying in his sleep to walk through it. The thought made him grin. It would have given her a hell of a turn, all right. With the sleepwalking hip hypothesis in mind, he was able to analyze the causes of the dream, and he did so with a certain eagerness. He had walked to the pet cemetery because it had become associated with another moment of recent stress. It had, in fact, been the cause of a serious argument between him and his wife, and also, he thought with growing excitement, it was associated in his mind with his daughter's first encounter with the idea of death, something his own subconscious must have been grappling with last night when he went to bed. Damn lucky I got back to the house okay. I don't even remember the p that part. must have come back on autopilot. It was a good thing he had. He couldn't imagine what it would have been like to have wakened this morning by the grave of Smucky the Cat disoriented, covered with dew, and probably yet scared shitless, as Rachel also would have been, undoubtedly. But it was over now. Put paid to, Lewis thought, with a measurable relief. Yes, but what about the things he had he said when he was dying, his mind tried to ask, and Lewis shut it up fast. That evening, with Rachel ironing and Ellie and Gage sitting in the same chair, both of them engrossed with the Muppet show, Lewis told Rachel casually about he believed he might go for a short walk to get a little air. Will you be back in time to get me to help put me me put the gauge to bed? She asked without looking up from her ironing. You know, he goes better when you're there, sure he said. Where you going where you where are you going, Daddy? Ellie asked, not looking away from the T V Kermit was about to be punched in the eye by Miss Piggy. Just out back, hon. Oh, Lewis went out. Fifteen minutes later he was in the pet cemetery looking around curiously and coping with a strong feeling of deja vu. That he had been here was beyond doubt. The little grave marker put up to honor the memory of Smucky the cat was knocked over. He had done that when the vision of Pascal approached near the end of what he could remember of the dream. Lewis righted it absently and walked over to the deadfall. He didn't like it. The memory of all these weather whitened branches and dead trees turning into a pile of bones still had the power to chill. He forced himself to reach out and touch one. Balanced precariously on the jackstraw pile, it rolled and fell, bouncing down the side of the heap. Lewis jumped back a step before it could touch his shoe. He walked along the deadfall, first to the left, then to the right. On both sides, the underbrush closed in so thickly as to be impenetrable. Nor was it the kind of brush you'd try to push your way through, not if you were smart, Lewis thought. There was... Lush masses of poison ivy grown close to the ground. All his life, Lewis had heard people boast that they were immune to the stuff. But he knew that almost no one really was. And farther in were some of the biggest, most wicked-looking thorns he had ever seen. Lewis strolled back to the rough center of the deadfall. He looked at it, hands stuck in the back pockets of his jeans. You're not going to try and climb that, are you? Not me, boss. Why would I want to do a stupid thing like that? Great. Had me worried for just a minute there, Lou. Looks like a good way to land in your own infirmary with a broken ankle, doesn't it? Sure it does. Also, it's getting dark. Sure that he was all altogether in total agreement with himself, Lewis began to climb the dead ball. He was halfway up when he felt it shift under his feet with a peculiar rocking, with a peculiar creaking sound. Roll them bones, Doc. When the pilot shifted again, Lewis began to clamber back down. The tail of his shirt pulled out of his pants. He reached solid ground without incident and dusted crumbled bits of bark off his hand. He walked back to the head of the path which would return him to his house, to his he children who would want a story before bed, to church, who was enjoying his last day as a card-carrying tomcat and lady killer, to tea in the kitchen with his wife after the kids were down. He surveyed the clearing again before leaving. Struck by its green silence, tendrils of green of ground fog had appeared from nowhere and beginning to wind across round the markers. Those concentric circles, as if all unknowing, the childish hands of North Ludlow's generation had uh, built a kind of scale model Stonehenge. But Lewis, is this all? Although he had gotten only the barest glimpse over the top of the dread 
the deadfall before the shifting sensation had made him nervous. He could have sworn there was a path beyond, leading deeper into the woods. No business of yours, Lewis. You've got to let this go. Okay, boss. Lewis turned and headed home. He stayed up that night an hour after Rachel went to bed, reading a stack of medical journals he had already been through, refusing to admit that the thought of going to bed, going to sleep, made him nervous. He had ne never had an episode of som somnambulism before, and there was no way to be sure it was an isolated incident. Until it did or didn't happen again, he heard Rachel get out of bed, and then she called down. Softly, Lou, hon, you coming up? Just was, he said, turning out the lamp over his study desk and getting up. It took a good deal longer than seven minutes to shut the machine down that night, listening to Rachel draw the long, calm breaths of deep sleep beside him. The apparition of Victor Pascal around less, seemed less dreamlike. He would close his eyes and see the door crashing open. There he was, a special guest star, Victor Pascal, standing there in his jogging shorts, pallid under his summer tan, his collarbone poking up. He would slide down towards sleep, think about how it would be to come fully coldly awake in the pet cemetery, to see those roughly concentric circles lit by moonlight, to have to walk back awake along the path through the woods. He would think these things and then snap fully awake again. It was sometime after midnight when sleep finally crept on his blind side and bagged him. And bagged him. There was no dreams. He woke up promptly at 7.30 to the sound of cold autumn rain beating against the window. He threw the sheets back with some apprehension. The ground sheet on his bed was flawless. No purist would describe his feet with their rings of heel calluses that way, but they were at least clean. Lewis caught himself whistling in the shower. I'm going to stop there even though the next chapter is short. Stop at chapter 19. We'll get, I mean, we'll be getting into chapter 19 in the next video. If you enjoyed the video, please hit like and subscribe and comment below and the notification bell. And stay tuned for the next installment of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. And you have a good night. Thank you.